for two years, I traveled to more than 25 different fab labs, hackerspaces and makerspaces across the globe, looking for answers to questions like, how can I support people in creating their own products? If I share my designs with the world, can I still make a living? And as a consequence of this, how can we achieve global collaboration and local manufacturing? My journey has taken me from way up north above the Arctic Circle to Central Africa, from the coast of Peru to downtown Tokyo. So why global collaboration? Well, if we all share knowledge and collaborate across the globe, we will work as one collective intelligence and there is nothing we cannot do. Why local manufacturing? There is obvious benefits to short transportation of materials and finished goods, but there's also a tremendous value for people to know the origins of the products they consume and if that origin is close to where they are, it's a much larger chance that they will appreciate the final result. Why personal manufacturing? When you make something yourself, you come to appreciate uh, the thing you have created way more than if you simply bought it the emotional value of what you have created is much higher than the simple financial value of what you have bought. The experience of personal manufacturing can become a life-enhancing moment of self-expression and self-empowerment. And you are much less likely to throw away a product you made yourself and much more likely to repair it. Simply put, personal manufacturing is a way of filling your world with more meaningful things. Why share ideas openly? When you have a new idea, it feels entirely new. But if you analyze any new idea, it's actually composed out of several existing ideas, ways of doing things, technical invention, approaches and concepts. But you have added your own personality, making it your own idea, bringing all those components further by adding a little bit of yourself. It is natural then that somebody else would build further upon your creation to create a new idea. But if you lock your idea down in a cage, defining it as intellectual property, nobody else can build further upon your idea. Unless they unlock the cage by acquiring a license. The problem with this system is acquiring and creating and dealing with licenses requires a large amount of time and money. So there's tremendous possibility for ideas to freely flow and thrive and multiply if you take away the locks and keys of creation. But these thoughts are not new. The following quotes were stated 152 years ago by Isenberg Kingdom Brunel, known as the father of modern machine tools. I believe, paradoxical as it may seem, that the privileges thus promised and granted to inventors are most injurious to them. To understand this, it must be known and borne in mind that useful inventions or improvements in the present day, certainly in 999 cases out of a thousand, are not new discoveries, but generally slight modifications of what is already in use. The consequence is that most good things are being thought of by many persons at the same time, and if there were more publicity and freedom of communication, instead of concealment and mystery, Ten times or a hundred times the number of useful ideas would be generated by each man, and with less mental effort and far less expenditure of time and money. Without the hopes of any exclusive privileges, I believe that a clever man would produce many more good ideas, and derive much more easily some benefit from them. It is true that he will aim only at earning a few pounds instead of dreaming of thousands, but he will earn these few pounds frequently and without interfering with his daily pursuits. On the contrary, he will make himself more useful. Brunel's thought says it all, but these thoughts are extra relevant today because of our incredible ease of communication and insane potential for knowledge sharing with digital tools. 
Why is it Fab Labs? Fab Labs is a global network of people who wants to collaborate and share knowledge. It is also a global network of open workspaces featuring digital manufacturing equipment that allows anybody to make almost anything. Every Fab Lab has a standardized set of well-chosen digital fabrication machines. The ShopBot is a large CNC milling machine that allows you to carve away material layer by layer with a higher level of precision. The Modella does the same, but slow and small with an incredible amount of precision. The laser cutter cuts and engraves material with a high power CO2 laser. The vinyl cutter cuts material with a tiny blade. And the 3D printer builds objects by depositing layers of plastic. But at the end of the day, Fab Lab is all about the people, which Håkon always reminds us. And don't forget, a Fab Lab is a global network of people that want to cooperate and share knowledge. <laughs>
får en chans, ja. Så han stabiliserer seg. Ja. Kom da. Det gick inte så här. Haha! Like a pro! Det där var vi se är väl lika. Jag kan inte se någon annan där. Det där hade ju gjort tid. Nej, det var jag. För en vecka sedan. We tried to get a hexacopter flying with open source microcontroller. This turned out to be so difficult that uh, even the rocket scientists of Tokyo University struggled to help us out. Luckily, I got the hexacopter flying again. But unfortunately, it turned out that uh, it's kind of difficult to learn how to fly a hexacopter, not only make one. While visiting awesome maker Jerry Isdale on Maui, I made a few experiments uh, not so successful with uh, polycarbonate. And ultimately it turned out that the uh, wood was also a good choice for the hexacopter arms. At the AS220 in Providence. And in Sevilla it all got assembled, finished, polished, screwed together and uh, flying again. In the end I didn't get to shoot anything from the air from the hexacopter except that uh, one glorious opening shot at Fab Lab Lingen. But it turned out that the quest to build a hexacopter was way more learningful and enjoyable than to actually have one built that I could use to shoot from the air for my documentary. And the surprising outcome from this project was that the two-sided milling of the propellers became a great educational tool. So I ended up teaching how to make propellers in Japan, the United States, Kenya. And Israel.
we created the Hon Fab Lab in Indonesia, he actually made the entire interior of the Fab Lab with the Fab Lab tools. And then I saw the opportunity to maybe show that uh, objects and designs created in uh, Fab Lab can be beautiful as well, and also ergonomic. So instead of simply having flat planes to sit on, I thought we could work with the contours of digital fabrication in order to create a very organic and comfortable seat. So I developed a parametric chair where you could change the input profile curves to adapt the seat. And these profile curves would then be interpolated in order to create a smooth transition from inner to outer profile curve. We sourced some material, put our files on the machine and ran the job, glued it together and voila, we had the first chair. The interesting part of this story is that we chose to share this design. We published it so other people could download it. Something very magical can happen when an idea goes from your head, comes into existence and then is allowed to freely flow around the world. What can happen when an easily customizable design is shared openly? At FabLab Sevilla, three groups of students downloaded the design, played around with the parameters, added a few of their own ideas, and created three new chairs in a day. At Fab Lab Amsterdam, world famous cellist Francis Marie Witte fell in love with a layer chair after a performance in the Theatre Monotonicum. When she learned that the chair could actually be tailor made to any proportions, she almost flipped out. So we had no choice but to make her a tailor made, perfectly customized cello playing chair. The seat is at 550 millimeters and is inclined slightly forwards so that she can sit on the edge while playing the cello. She also took part of the manufacturing process and the design process, truly making the chair her own. It has also been great to receive photographs from people around the world who has downloaded and made their own version of the chair. 
like for instance Nick Graham's layer stool in New Zealand and Jean-Michel Molinar's version in France. And in the Fab Lab in Tel Aviv, Ohad Michaus was waiting with a nice surprise. They had made a version of the chair there as well. But the most extravagant version of the layered chair was inspired by the mountains of northern Norway. So again, we travel up north, way above the Arctic Circle. Håkon Carlsen Jr. of MIT Fab Lab Lingen was dreaming of new dining chairs for his grandiose dining table, with the profile of the backrests matching the various Lingen Alps surrounding the Fab Lab. We collected a profile of 16 mountain peaks in the vicinity, pulled the curves of the parametric chairs very high, cut the profile with the profile of the mountains, and threw the files in the milling machine. I am currently working with small-scale manufacturer Serendip in Norway to see if they can produce the layer chair for the local market under a royalty license. And I'm also working with Rock Spa Manufacturing in Chicago, Illinois. So the layer chair experiment is still alive. We have seen what can happen when an idea who has come into creation is allowed to flow around the world freely. The next story is also about a creation that flew around the world. But this creation did not originate from me. It was designed somewhere else and I only mediated the design. FabLab Kamakura is now linked to FabLab in a very different place. Aru Fablab Kenya is situated in a village lacking an electricity grid. So we were working on a low cost gravity light that provides a point of illumination simply by letting gravity pull a set of gears. There are numerous versions of this design, but we thought it would be interesting if you could actually manufacture this in the Fab Lab locally. So we prototyped the lamp using the laser cutter and cheap plywood. Yes. Wow. 
creating light from a sustainable energy source feels great. That is the gear. The gear, maybe the gear slipped. One gear. Is the rope? Mm. Is the rope? Is the rope? <laughs> However, there are definitely point of improvement before we are at a sellable design. Like most Fab Labs, Auto Fab Lab is struggling with their funding. So they asked me if I could help them design products that they could manufacture from leather to sell to tourists. But I had already seen a beautiful leather product in Fab Lab Kamakura. The leather slippers were designed in collaboration with leather craftsman Kuluska and fabricated on a laser cutter. So we asked our friends in Japan if they would like to share their designs with us, which they did. The next thing we did was to adapt the design to the local environment and culture. While walking on the paths of Majiva, I noticed the classic African mud crack patterns. We photographed these and translated those into vectors. And we applied our vectorized crack pattern to the sandal design. We bought some second-hand motorbike tires, assembled it all together, and now we had the localized Kenyan version of the Japanese Kuluska slippers. And we could tell the tourists that if they bought these slippers, they would be forever walking on African ground. We also used the Kuluska design in a series of workshops where I taught the local Fab Lab users how they would go about designing such a slipper from scratch and how they could modify the existing design. Having a simple yet well-developed design as a reference helped tremendously in giving the users a boost in their design abilities. And it also quickly led to a series of different shoes and sandals being tested out in the lab. It even became the sprout of a new fashion label, David L. It turned out that Barack Obama's grandmother was living close to the lab, so they asked if I wanted to go and talk to her. I said we are makers, not talkers, so let's go and make her a present. We bought some Nile Perch fish leather from Lake Victoria. We downloaded an image of her grandson and applied it to the design. And with the help of a bit of laser engraving, cutting magic, and good old handwork, we had made grandson slippers for Mama Obama. Sharon Obama from R and Jim. Eric. Can I pronounce that? Ta da! <laughs> so you have this nice shoe. Lucky for us, the present was well received 
And uh, Sarah Obama asked us to come back with 10 more pairs. I love the story of the Kuliska slippers because it shows in so many ways the power of knowledge sharing. The beautiful design came into existence by combining traditional and new knowledge. The creation and knowledge was then transferred to Kenya, where it was adapted to the local climate and culture. It then became a great educational tool and starting point for exploration in the lab. And it's a great example of how personal manufacturing can be a fantastic way of creating stories and experiences. <laughs> so, I told you a few stories. If I had more time, I would have loved to tell you about the prosthetic foot in Indonesia, the Wailing Wall of Jerusalem, the jewelry packaging in Iceland, the mobile street kitchen of Peru, the medieval age jewelry of Lingen, the handshake gorilla in Manchester in Japan, the lounge chair from the curve, the reactivation machine, the ass stool in Indonesia, the mango earrings of Kenya, the high heeled shoes of Shushanguva, the digital garden in Sevilla, the pixel glasses of Tokyo, the painting with the shopot in Providence and the parametric gas stool in Amsterdam. And perhaps of all the parties we had and all the amazing people of the network, but that would be a different kind of movie. Instead, I'm going to provide you with some conclusions. So first, here are my top five thoughts on how to achieve global collaboration with digital fabrication. Number five. It's all about the documentation. In order for people to build further upon your work, they need to access it. So share your CAD files, machine settings, photos, screenshots, and which materials you use. Number four, be empathic. Think about how people perceive the knowledge that you share. What is the first thing people see when they open your CAD file? In which sequence does your photos tell the clearest story? Which information is superfluous? Too much information is no information. Number three, be prepared to accept the unexpected. Collaborative projects work the best when you open up for unexpected outcomes. If you have a very specific goal with a very specific methodology in mind, you'll probably be better off paying people to execute your plans with you. Number two, finish your projects. If you would like people to build further upon your work, it helps a lot if you bring your work up to a specific goal and finish your documentation. Unfinished projects have a hard time being adopted in society. And number one, have fun. Nobody likes a grumpy face and play is the best way to learn. Don't be afraid to try out or propose silly ideas might lead to something spectacular. When you fail, document your failure so other people can learn from it too. Things that go wrong is comical and humor brings about the best atmosphere. And one more list. Here is top five thoughts on making a living with a sharing approach to design. Number five, sell experiences over licenses, stories over products. The story of how your creation came into being is your strongest point. Number four, signalize your intent when publishing. It is possible to make business and receive profits from the utilization of your creation, even though it has been shared. Explain your intentions when you publish a design and you might find a valuable business partner. Number three, don't be afraid of ghosts. The execution of an idea is the most valuable part. There tends to be far more positive consequences from sharing than most people expect. Number two, use your love and passion. Being genuinely open can be a great advantage. Use your love for your work to charm your way and keep your motivation. And the number one top thought or making a living with a sharing approach to design, build a family.
Build a small network of global partners that you trust. Have a gentleman's agreement for your profit sharing and take care of each other. The corporate giants of the forests are growing ever larger, but there's plenty of room for collaborative undergrowth. So, now there's nothing else for me to do than to put these thoughts, experiences and conclusions into action and see if I can make a living by sharing.